start off with a little bit about me. So I've been in the games industry for about 10 years. The majority of, of that have been at Rare. I'm an audio programming specialist, which might seem a bit weird for a performance talk, but audio being one of those real-time systems, you have to, have to be on the game for performance. I'm a member of the engine team at Rare. Now, the engine team is full of loads of specialists. We've got networking, we've got physics, we've got all the, the core specialties in our engine team. But we muck in everywhere. And we are currently working on Sea of Thieves, which is an ever-evolving title. Uh, we've been going for a little over a year now. We've got our next big update coming soon, and we've got a little trailer to show you. So I, I believe the press embargo has just lifted for some of the reviews for this, or previews. So uh, do go online and check out what people are saying about it just now. So what am I going to cover today? I'm going to cover how we kept a consistent frame rate in Sea of Thieves. It's a, it's a challenging environment to do so. Um, I'm going to do that with lots of profiling data. There's going to be lots of profiling data in this presentation um, through different, different methods. Then I'm going to cover engineering techniques that we used to gracefully scale our game systems. We've got a lot of stuff going on in Sea of Thieves, and we want to make sure that the quality is delivered. And I'm going to go into plenty of technical detail. So I will give some primers and some of this stuff. Uh, hopefully, it's all, it's all spelled out. So what kind of problems are we dealing with here? So we're a client server architecture. We're a multiplayer game. Got lots going on, got many dynamic elements, and we, we, we have the ethos of tools, not rules. We try and give loads of stuff to the players and see how that emerges in different behaviors. It's very unpredictable, some of the stuff. We have a large variance in our scene complexity. You can have a, a case where a single player is in a cave looking at some cave paintings, compared with four galleons laden with treasure all battling it out. Maybe somebody's fallen overboard. There's a bunch of sharks going after them. Large variance in scene complexity. And we're multi-platform as well. We're talking about PC, min and low spec PCs. We're talking about Xbox One. And we're talking about our server architecture as well, which is a single core in the cloud. And we be began development of Sea of Thieves on Unreal Engine 4.6, which feels like an age ago. Um, and we actually shipped on 4.10. So we're missing a lot of the optimizations and a lot of the improvements that came in, especially now we're talking 4.22, I'm going to talk about our ticking and how we worked with ticks. Well, I'll give a quick primer on what is a tick in case some people at an Unreal Developer Conference don't know what a tick is. Um, we're essentially talking about a virtual function call, either in native code or in blueprint code. And this is housed inside a tick function structure, which controls what group you're ticking in, if you want to tick asynchronously or not, the frequency of your tick, and any dependencies that your tick might have. We also have a stage at the start of the frame where the engine decides what ticks are going to happen this frame. And part of the reason that we investigated this early on was that we were spending more than five milliseconds at the start of our frame. We're trying to hit 30 frames per second on Xbox One. More than five milliseconds spent just deciding what to tick. That's over 15% of our frame budget. Here's a little pix capture there. We use pix quite a lot. 
We use uh, some of Unreal's tools as well. We use Pix quite a lot. But when we're testing performance, we approached it in the same way that we cover a lot of our other testing. Specifically for testing, the worst case is what matters. It doesn't matter if your average is really good if when you hit the worst, your game basically falls apart. We used a lot of automated testing to track when someone makes a change, how does that reflect in not just behavioral, but in terms of performance as well. So we have, I just can't really see it on the slide very well, but this is one of our test maps that we have where it's simulating that four galleon almost worst case. Our, our worst case is really bad. But this is almost worst case. Galleons firing each other. And through our automated systems, we'll get this report from our build system that we can go and look at and trace as people make changes. How does that affect the performance ongoing? I highly recommend you check out Jessica Baker's talk later today at 4.15 on our automated testing process and pipeline and culture, and it's really good. So how do we analyze this data? Like I say, we have a Team City report. Team City is our, our online build system. We get a report out of that. And like I said before, we also use PIX for uh, the CPU and GPU captures on Xbox One. There'll be a lot of PIX captures in this presentation. We also use WPA occasionally to uh, uh, track larger scale playtests. But we'll also use Unreal stat files as well. These are really good. You get the same kind of data out of the stat file as we do in PIX, just aggregated over a lot of time. We, this is particularly useful for our server performance captures. And occasionally, we use the in-game stat visualizations. But these typically are more for memory uh, profiling rather than CPU profiling. But in this presentation, I'm only really going to talk about uh, these two here. So for those of you who haven't seen PIX, PIX is freely available for you to look, look at on PC. But uh, here's a frame capture from Sea of Thieves in our performance test map that I just showed you. And I'm just going to talk you through a little bit about what this means. Uh, Probably very similar data to what the new Unreal Insights stuff looks like. That looks really cool. I'm quite excited about that. Um, this is what we've been using for a long time. So if I start annotating this, we've got our begin frame here and our end frame there. We have the game thread across the top on core zero. We then have the rendering thread here and the RHI thread here. I'm not really going to talk about any of the rendering stuff. I just wanted to put it in there for completeness. It was a big body of, of stats in this capture. So we now have, here's the pre-physics tick group. We have the during physics tick group. You can see on the other cores, there's the physics running asynchronously. Then we have our end physics tick group, the post physics, and the post update work. We don't really do much in the post update work. But What's also interesting to call out is in the post physics, here's some animation that we're doing. When animation runs, it runs asynchronously, where well, you can choose to run asynchronously. But that will also, anything you do in a tick group, like the animation here, will hold up that tick group until the next one can run. So this frame was 43 milliseconds. Pretty poor, really. <laughs> Not quite our 33 milliseconds for our 30 frames per second budget, but Sea of Thieves is an ever-evolving game. We're always adding more content. So we have to keep working at, at making sure our performance is, is critical. But we were a lot worse. Back in 2016, we were looking at 113 millisecond frame times, totally unplayable on Xbox. We were game thread bound, which might surprise some people. Uh, we had a lot of stuff going on. And there wasn't really one big thing to tackle. We couldn't look at one thing and then go, boom, we fixed it, fixed our performance. That's partly because the way that we developed our systems is they were designed in isolation. So a sail is a sail, this is a wheel, this is a cannon. And as they grew, they just got more and more costly. And we couldn't apply 
sweeping optimizations to these things. We could do micro-optimizations, but ultimately, it was very difficult to control our worst case frames. And in 2016, we'd written a lot of our core mechanics, our core systems for Sea of Thieves. So going back to the drawing board wasn't really an option. This is data I got out of a sampling capture during a playtest. And as you can see, hopefully you can see, the majority of time, nearly 50% of our whole CPU time on core one, core zero, sorry, the game core, was spent on ticking things. Some of the other time was spent in physics and in our networking. But we soon discovered that that's because our frame times were so bad that the physics was having to work harder and the networking was receiving more data from the server in a single frame, so it had a lot more to process. Which meant, really, we should be focusing on looking at our ticks. What do we do with our ticks? Before I go into ticking, I want to give a little primer on CPU caches. Specifically, this is on the Xbox One. So the Xbox One has two CPU modules, each with four cores. I'm just going to show one of the modules here. So we've got our four cores here, and we have our main memory here. But you can't really use main memory directly from your CPU. Whatever you're doing on your CPU, it either has to be in your instruction cache or your data cache. And these are both 32 kilobytes in size. These are your, your L1 caches. But you can't go from main memory directly into your L1 cache either. You have to go through your L2 cache, which is shared between four cores. Each module has its own L2 cache. So you go in from main memory into your L2 cache, and then either into your instruction cache or your data cache. If you then mutate stuff in your data cache, it needs to read it back out to your L2 and then back out into your main memory. This is a problem for us because doing so, you have to do it on all the cores, they all share the L2 cache. And you're talking about quite high amounts of latency between accessing these, these uh, sections of memory. It's a hierarchy. So if something's in L1, it must be in L2 as well. So to give a, a bit more of a context about this, consider these two bits of disassembly, where we are moving some memory. We're moving an integer out of RCX and offset into RCX, moving an integer into a register, and then we're adding, those, adding that integer to another integer. So if we consider where that could have been in memory, I'm going to borrow a diagram from Mike Acton, his data-oriented design in C++ talk. I don't mean to plagiarize, but it's a really good talk, and the diagram is excellent at showcasing what this looks like. So if the data is in L1, it's really quick. But if the data is in L2, it's a little bit slower. And then if we're talking about the data is in RAM, think about what the CPU could be doing at this point. And if your CPU is out of order execution, it might be able to do some stuff. But you can't guarantee there'll be enough instructions in its pipe to, to reorder some stuff. If it's in order, you're guaranteed to be waiting that long before you can do your next instruction. Now, that's important with data. We're doing a data access here. But what happens if these are not in your cache? These are the addresses of the instructions you're running on. They could be in the cache. And if you're linearly zipping through your instructions, they probably will be. Most modern x64 CPUs can prefetch. They can predict where you're going and will prefetch for you. But if you branch, if you do a, a jump, or if you call a virtual function, it can't know where that virtual, where that memory is. So you'll incur one of these latencies. Our code's small, right? Not really. <laughs> some of this code is pretty big. Um, I did a, a little bit of a, hopefully you can read some of that, a little bit of working out how big some of these functions are. I've got some of our own functions from Sea of Thieves and some functions from Unreal. And this is as a percentage of your L1 cache. So doing a tick, just the exclusive size of the tick function for you character movement component is over 12% of your L1 cache. That's not the callers and the callees. That's just the function. I did start looking through the, the hierarchy, the call hierarchy, but I stopped at around about 
30, nearly 35% of your L1 cache. It's quite, quite a lot of code that you go through. And we've obviously added a lot on top with our game code on top of Unreal Engine's code. So what happens when this hits scale? Here's what our individual ticks look like. We've got our timeline. Let's say we tick a sale. So we've never ticked a sale before. We bring in the instructions. Cool, that's fine. We expect we have to do that. We've never ticked a sale before. Then we take a compass. It's figuring out what direction north is. That's fine. We've never done one before. We'll bring that into the instruction cache. Oh, another sale. That's cool. That means that's already in the cache, hot in the cache. We can use that code again. Canon, we've never seen one of those before. So we've got to bring that into the instruction cache. Oh, we've got to take a barrel. But our instruction cache is full. So that means we'll get rid of the, uh, the compass because we've never ticked that. We've not ticked that for a while. So we probably won't tick that again. That's fine. Uh, oh, another barrel. That's cool. In the instruction cache. Whoops. We've hit a compass. We've just evicted that. So we need to bring that back in. We haven't ticked the sails for a while. Let's get rid of those. Now we can tick the compasses. Cannon. Cool, it's already in the cache. And you can see where this is going. Oh, sail. Yeah, we've got to evict something else now. And then another barrel. <laughs> and this is what our frames were like, basically. We had so many ticks, and they were all interleaving with each other. And what we wanted to do was aggregate them together like this. Now, this particular problem is explained in Scott Myers' excellent CPU caches and where you can find them talk. He talks about this as a definitely not a theoretical problem. His example was quite theoretical. But we actually hit this, and hit this really hard. So how did we aggregate these ticks? Actors and components have their ticks disabled. Seems straightforward. Then we register them with a collection. So I'll show you some code for this in a, in a bit. Um, but the collection is essentially what houses a bunch of actors or components or anything really from within them. And it's keyed off a U-class type. Unreal's reflect, reflection is really useful here. It's very powerful and very fast to look up as well. So really good for keying off for our collections. And that collection then has a single tick function inside it, giving us all the benefits that Unreal's ticking system has with the uh, running asynchronously, um, choosing a frequency, dependencies, all that kind of stuff. And as I said, this gives us better instruction cache coherency. But with everything grouped together, it means we can also reduce our unnecessary work. I'll show some more of that soon. And with everything being in a tight loop, if you're updating in a loop at this point, we can do some single instruction, multiple data optimizations. The compiler might even be smart enough to help us out here as well. And I'll talk about this later, context-sensitive prioritization, sensitive to context. It's uh, a method that we, we've used quite heavily in our, in our game. Got a little quote for you from one of our principal engineers at Rare. One could argue the thing that basically saves this game is the fact we're doing a lot of the same thing all the time. So I'm going to go through, say, almost real world example. I've had to edit it a little bit for the slides, but it's basically a problem that we've had to solve in the game. So as you can imagine, Sea of Thieves, a lot of water. So we have components for caching where the height of the water is at that component's location, which then means that systems don't have to keep looking up at particular places. It avoids multiple queries, and the queries are not exactly cheap. So this looks like uh, this. Let me stop looking that way. Um, we've got a global accessor here where we're getting some kind of interface, which allows us to query the height at a particular location. And then we have our call to getting the height. And that's it. We cache the height afterwards. Not very much going on. Not really very much to actually optimize either. Maybe we don't need to optimize it. Maybe we do. But what does this look like in our frame? 
So tested this out with 100 components in our four ship scene. And here's where the ticks land in the frame. We're quite lucky here. Some of them were quite tightly grouped together, but they're not all in a straight line. So there have been some interruptions going on. And this took 1.16 milliseconds. You might think that's all right for 100 components, but we've had tweets of people with 100 treasure chests on their ship. As soon as that sinks, that's 100 items on top of all the other items in the island, in the uh, water. So it's not inconceivable to think of maybe 100, 200, 1,000 maybe. Considering that's just water height, you could, you could do a lot in 1.16 milliseconds. So what does it look like when it's aggregated? We've got our aggregation. This is the, the function that gets called in place of all our individual ticks, where we have our array of components we've collected. And we're calling the tick functions manually. Not really anything special. And the way that we aggregate them, typically we do this in begin play and end play, but you can do this whenever you want. We unregister the tick function if we're going to aggregate these things. And then we register it with our collection. We do a bit of a lazy evaluation here with, uh, if you're the first thing to be collected, you end up creating the collection with the tick inside it, which is what that lambda is for. And then on end play, we unregister the, the tick, unregister the component. So what does that do? That's a reasonably simple change. We haven't changed any logic yet for our, our tick. What does this look like? Same 100 components. It's now tightly packed inside our frame. But what has that done to the time? We've already had a 1.3 times improvement. Massive, yeah. But we could do better than that. So I talked about identifying unnecessary work. This is a, a zoom in of that aggregated tick. We've got our getting the, the global service. And we've also got our query. And then we've got it again, and then again, and again. And you'll notice that the very first one in that tick, in that group, is huge compared to all the subsequent ones. And that's the benefit of the, uh, well, probably the benefit of the instruction cache. The first one is long because we've had to wait for the instructions to come in. And then we're hot in the cache now, so everything's much faster. But how can we now logically change this to improve the speed? So we've got our tick, and that's the component tick internally. Let's just get rid of all that. And now we have a more optimized tick. We've got rid of the component tick altogether. We've got a single tick that, instead of looping through the components calling tick, we take out some of the work. So we've got our global state that we're accessing. We only do that once now per group of these things. And then we do a batched query rather than calling get water height individually. We break out all the locations of the components into an array because that's all we need to figure out the water height and what plane of water we're interested in. And then when we're finished, <clears throat> we get that data out and assign it back to our components. The important part of this bit here is this call here to building the query. This is a bit more involved. And actually, you might think this would be slower because we're doing a whole bunch more work. But the work's not too much. We're just going off getting the data we need for this query and putting it into uh, a data of some sort. It's easily usable by our service. So this actually means that we can do four height queries at once rather than one. And if we had individual ticks, We'd never have been able to do that. And like I said, the compiler can auto-vectorize some of this work. It doesn't in this case, but if you can help it, it can auto-vectorize. For example, this section of code here takes two arrays of floats and adds the elements together individually. Your compiler will happily take this and decide, I could do four, I could maybe do eight. It can happily optimize this for you. You don't have to worry about writing hand vectorized code in this case. What does that do to our time? So it's really small now in the frame, quite difficult to see, actually. And this has actually got us down quite a bit. 5.2 times more fast, <laughs> faster. 
This is on Xbox One. All these captures, all the captures you'll see through right here, unless otherwise stated, are on Xbox One. But how does this compare with Xbox One X? We still get the same kind of improvements, but it's, uh, it's already a little bit quicker on Xbox One X anyway, because the CPUs are slightly faster. And then how does this scale? So I said we've got 100 components. What happens if we had 500 components or 1,000 components? So as you can see here, we're still scaling linearly with our aggregated uh, uh, number of components, but far better than we scale. You see we kind of jump off a cliff at 500. So clearly this is having a good effect. But we're still scaling linearly. What happens if we had 10,000 components? Maybe that's unreasonable, maybe it's not. And in a emergent behaviors in our games, it's really hard to quantify what our worst case could be. So scaling gracefully, let's consider the different workloads between our different platforms we've got. So Xbox One, we've got eight cores. We have a fixed platform. We know what we can do on that one. High-end PC, we may have loads of cores, and probably very fast cores as well. We probably don't worry too much about that. Min-spec PC, we might only have two cores, and they might be slow cores. And on server, we only have one core. But what do they have to do? The Xbox One and the PCs, they're displaying somebody's view into the, into the world, whereas the server is the authority over the whole view. So they've got different, different types of workloads they've got to do. So maybe we could do some round-robin scheduling. We can decide, let's say, we do a fixed number of ticks each frame, where the number's capped, and we know that that's a manageable amount that we can do. And this is great. We've now got fixed costs. We don't scale linearly. We hit, hit, the, hit the max very quickly. But we get quite a bit of in increased latency when we do this. It takes a lot longer for something to see the tick. You'll probably have a higher time delta. Your animation might look a bit jittery at this point. Not really great for quality. So hopefully you can see this. Um, <clears throat> so I've got uh, uh, the alphabet here. And when one of these boxes flashes, that means it's ticked. So I've got two different types of round robin ticking happening, happening here. We've got one on the left side is ticking four a frame. And the one on the right side is ticking 10 a frame. So you can see on the four, it takes a long time for that to get back round again. It's quite a lot of latency. That looks like this in terms of ticks, but when you talk about it in latency terms, we're looking at like fifth of a second to tick everything. It's quite a lot of latency. You're going to notice that jitter in your animation. If you're ticking your particle systems infrequently, you're going to notice that you know, lose some smoothness there. So this is where we do our context-sensitive prioritization. We have a bit more context with all our stuff being aggregated together, and we do this per group. So you can make sure that different types of groups of things are prioritized correctly. We require a reference point to prioritize from. So not very useful for our server. Definitely useful for our clients, where we really want to focus the quality. And that's where it's needed the most. So for example, sort our ticks by priority, either distance to player in this case, tick only the closest 10. And then we can scale the priority for things that we haven't ticked as they shuffle up through our list. And that might look something like this. Well, it does look something like this. So the scaling is actually the important factor here. We have a, a table that we look into, <clears throat> which looks a little bit like this, where the x-axis is how many frames have passed since we haven't ticked. And the y-axis is how much are we going to scale our priority. Because we're scaling by distance, the smaller the value, the higher your priority. So what this does to our uh, latency comparisons, here's our round robin for reference. But then we start looking at latency, remembering we've sorted A is the closest, Z is the furthest away. And you can see that we've got the same quality as our uh, not doing round robin at all for the first few. And then the quality gradually 
scales down as it goes further away from you. And there's a different view of it with the, the latency. The latency does look really bad for when you're only doing four a frame, but that's when stuff's further away from you. If you don't really care about that kind of stuff, then you can keep your quality up close. We have different types of, uh, well, we can apply different types of priority scaling to this to change how we uh, prioritize them. So here's a normal one. But then we can have a, a more aggressive one that prioritizes things further, further back or evenly distributes the time we've got to tick things. Or we could have a more gentle scaling one. Say your stuff's quite not very sensitive to being latent, but you really want to have the quality up close. And for comparison, you can see the latency here, uh, the gentle table throwing a lot of latency out for far away, but up close, you've got quite a good uh, quality bar there. And this is with ticking 10 a frame. If we only tick four a frame, for comparison, we have the, the round robin in the graph as well. You've still got a lot of quality up to the closeness of, your, of the things that you're ticking. Far away, obviously, we, we lose some there. For this presentation, I used the algorithmvisualizer.org, which is fantastic. I highly recommend checking it out. You can write your code in the browser and then visualize it in the browser. That's where I captured these videos from. It's really cool. So I've talked about a real world, almost real world example. Now I'm going to cover a real world, a few real world examples. So we've aggregated our sale updates. This was a, the, one of the first ones we did in our game. And uh, it's because we have a lot of them. We've got seven sales per galleon. We've got quite a few galleons on the seas. So it's a good, it's a good test case for us, the first one we did. And they have a lot of responsibilities. They calculate the billowing based on the wind direction and the wind speed. They update the animations based on that billowing. And they set some dynamic materials. So lots of different things to test out for us. Now, the cost of this before we aggregated them, a gratuitous animation there. Uh, these are all the tick functions that the sales, that I think this was 42 sales, had. And that includes your skeletal mesh animations, the actor ticks, and some other components inside there. And this came to a total of 1.539 milliseconds, which we thought was actually unreasonable for our sales. We could do a lot more other stuff in that time. So when we looked at this, I'm showing here a, a Unreal stat capture in the Unreal profiler. Uh, I like using this because it gives you a nice average over a capture, as well as showing your worst and best frames, and then you can inspect as well. So from the sales average case, we're talking half a millisecond at this point, over two and a half times improvement. And this heavily used the prioritization methods we were doing, which looks a little bit like this. We have 42 sales in the scene, but I'm not going to ask you to count them, but we don't have 42 animation updates here. And with the way that we aggregated them, it also allowed us to do some work on different cores. So we have a case here where some work is happening on one thread, and then some dependent work can immediately kick off on another thread after we know we've finished a few of the uh, updates. Same with the animation here. Another system that we looked at is the particle systems. We are quite a particle heavy game, and uh, as you can see, the 20 milliseconds we were spending on our particles is quite excessive. Uh, but simply aggregating them not changing any logic whatsoever, simply aggregating them gave us that kind of improvement. And it also improved us at the start of our frame as well. We went from 786 ticks down to one. We got a 25% saving at the start of our frame, which looks a little bit like that. So some other systems that we aggregated. Now, not everything is worth aggregating. 
say you've only got something that's there's only one there's only one of a lot of the audio stuff that we have in the game is local to your client and we only need one of those systems so we don't bother aggregating that and in some cases we found with things that have dependencies you might want to pull some stuff out of an aggregate tick and put it on its own so it can have its own dependency so some time to reflect what kind of flaws does this system have the tick registration is a very manual process. Either you forget to do it or you do it incorrectly. And you can cause problems. So it's not great. And by problems, we've occasionally had cases where while an actor is ticking inside an aggregate tick, it then calls destroy on itself, deleting itself, and then we continue ticking, but it's removed itself from the array, resized the array, and then we crash. So there's ways that you can get around that, but if you don't know that could happen, that's something you have to be careful of. We also found that because it's an opt-in, very manual process, it doesn't really force you to think differently about your data or your systems that you're working on. So we end up still writing systems as uh, individuals rather than thinking of them as a batch. And I hinted on this before, you can't have explicit dependencies between individual things within an aggregated tick. But if you want that, if you need it, you can take it out of the tick. You still benefit everything else is in that aggregate. But you can take it out and have it on its own. So some future work. Maybe we just address all these flaws. But realistically, aggregating by default is probably going to give us the biggest bang for buck. But also, I talked a lot about instruction cache and not a sausage about data cache. So data cache is probably a really good one where we can, we can go into. But maybe you could help us, or one of you could help us, two of you could help us, because Rare is hiring. Rare is a wonderful place to work. I really, I've been working there for six years. I love the place. It's a fantastic place. Uh, out in the English countryside, really beautiful landscapes, and lots of dogs. If you like dogs, you can bring your dog to work. Uh, and I have to show this guy. I'm doing a thing with some friends where we have to take this guy around and show him a good time. So uh, we've taken him around Prague, me and my fiance, and uh, I wanted to show him here for you all. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.